Oh my word, they've only gone and done it. They've introduced the three peep per mile road charge on EVs. What does that mean? How will we survive? Well, panic ye not. We know what it means, and today I can tell you that. Let's look at how the new per mile tax will work here in the UK. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew and today I want to share with you what we know about the 3p per mile tax being introduced on EVs from April 2028, which was announced as part of the budget this week. I say no because we don't need to guess. Wild speculation is not required. It turns out that the government initiated consultation on the new tax, officially named EVED, and the consultation document tells us how it will work. I'll put a link to that consultation in the description of the video so you can go and look for yourself if you like. Indeed, you might want to provide your input to the consultation if there is anything you are concerned about. The consultation is open to the public so we can all have our say if we want, on certain aspects anyway. But let's go through what we know first, and then you can decide whether you might want to do so. So firstly, it's officially going to be called EVED, that's Electric Vehicle Excise Duty, and the name gives us some clues as to how it will work. The idea here is that it gets administered using the system we already have for managing VED, that's what some of us call road tax. The basic premise is that we continue to get a letter through the post, a V11 reminder. Using the V11, we will pay for the VED like normal, except during the process we'll be asked two extra questions. Namely, what is your current odometer reading? In other words, what's the car's current mileage? And how many miles do you expect to drive in the upcoming period? Those two figures, along with any values from previous years, will be used to calculate the next year's EVED. It will be added to the normal VED and you'll pay for both. Payment methods and periods will remain the same. You can pay for 12 months up front, 6 months up front, or monthly via direct debit. And you can do this administration via the existing routes too, online on the telephone or at the post office, just as now. The biggest change will be remembering to read the odometer before starting the payment process, but you're also going to have to estimate your mileage. Now estimating your annual mileage in advance might seem odd, but actually we already do it. It's a required part of getting insurance, so it's not really anything new. And to be clear, the document does call out that it's all mileage, no matter where you do those miles, in this country or abroad. They did consider making it UK only, but it just gets too complicated to verify what mileage was done where. This aspect is what a lot of people have been confused by or dismissive of in the comments I've seen on other people's videos. Why, people say, should I pay for mileage I do in other countries? Well, if you see this as a road tax, then I understand the confusion. However, if you see this as a fairly arbitrary form of general taxation, then maybe it will make a bit more sense. This tax, the document says, is a replacement for fuel duty. It makes that clear. And we all know that fuel duty isn't spent on the roads. Not all of it, anyway. It's another way to get income for all of the public services we use, the NHS, social services, protective services and so on. Consider an alternative, the sweater tax. They could try to tax you for wearing sweaters, charge per sleeve or something. They wouldn't care where you wore the sweaters, whether in the UK or overseas. It's just an arbitrary measurement, somewhat like the window tax of old. People say that there are two certainties in life, death and taxes, and this is one of those. Not death, just tax. I completely get that it seems weird, that it seems somewhat nonsensical, but it is what it is, an easy way to tax you to make up for a drop in fuel duty. OK, so this is largely self-reporting, so why wouldn't you simply lie? 
well, that's a bit less clear at the moment. That's one of the questions in the consultation. What should be punitive and what shouldn't? Well, one thing we know is that there will be an annual verification of your odometer reading. Generally, that will come from your MOT test, but a couple of extra verifications are likely in the first few years before MOTs are due. What's proposed, and likely, I'd say, is that you will visit an MOT centre to get the verification done after years one and two. There is a question about the need for that in the consultation, but I doubt the answers will sway their opinion. If that is what happens, then there will be no charge. The government picks up the tab for that one. They suggest that it could be done as part of annual servicing in many instances, but a lot of service centres don't do MOTs, so I'm not confident that it's quite that simple. The suggestions about what happens when selling a vehicle, declaring it off-road or scrapping it. The only one of those that looks odd to me is when selling. The current suggestion is that when selling a car, the EVED goes with the car and you adjust the sale price accordingly. That makes no sense as far as I can see. The seller and the buyer could have quite different usage profiles, so a person expecting to do only a few miles might buy from someone who declared they would do a lot and end up paying for an allocation they don't need. That would disadvantage the seller as well, whose car would be more expensive in relation to other sellers. We don't do this with VED, not anymore, so is it the right thing for EVED? I do see the problem though. The thing I've never liked about the new mechanism of chopping in your VED when you sell a car and getting a refund is that you can lose up to a month's VED value. You don't get back the current month, only from the start of the next month, all of the whole months that are left. Yet the buyer has to buy from the start of the existing month, so the tax for that month is paid twice. That sucks, especially if the VED is expensive, and EVED could be expensive for some people. If you do a lot of miles, then losing a twelfth of the year's EVED could be quite a lot of money. So yeah, I see treating it the same way as VED as being problematic, but selling the EVED value isn't going to work, is it? I think it's time to fix the problem with VED and pro rata the refund you get when you sell, and then do that for both taxes. That seems fairer to me. How about you? There's one more thing I want to call out from the document, and that's the value of the tax. They've called it out as being half of what an average ICE car driver pays, and they say they intend to maintain that ratio. It feels like a bit of a pledge waiting to be broken, but it is there as an offhand pledge of sorts, so that's at least the theory. Let's see if that really happens in the future. OK, a couple of quick notes. Firstly, this video describes how the tax will work. However, if you wonder why it starts in 2028, then I've already done a video on that. I'll link to that video from the end screen as well as from the description. Have a watch of that if you haven't already done so and wonder why the tax is needed at all. Secondly, there was a little good news in the budget this time around, a little Brucey bonus. The government have moved to reduce energy bills a bit by moving a bit of the policy costs off our bills. I don't think that will make much difference to home charging for EV drivers as most of us probably charge overnight and I'm not sure overnight prices will reduce. However, what it might help is the cost of public charging. Those policy costs don't just affect us residential customers, they apply to businesses as well, including charge point operators. With those items removed from bills, bringing the cost of a kilowatt hour of electricity down by about three and a half pence or so, we might see public charging get a bit cheaper for a change, instead of always getting more expensive. Charge point operators don't have to pass those savings on to us. Their sums are very complicated and they are not swimming in money like you might imagine. 
but hopefully they might pass them on once they come into force. All right, that's just about enough from me for the moment, but I'm interested in your response to this. Do you feel aggrieved about the amount you will be charged? Can you see the collection mechanism I've described today working correctly? Let me know in the comments below. Furthermore, are you tempted to respond to the consultation? It's a total of 20 questions, 16 plus who you are and how they contact you. However, you don't have to respond to them all in detail if you don't care about some of them. I'm intrigued to know if you will respond, and if so, what areas are of concern to you. I'll be very interested to hear your thoughts now that we've had a bit more detail and a little while to digest the information. I'll also try to answer any questions you might have, of course, place them in the comments section as well. Thanks very much for joining me today for this slightly special episode. This, after all, is video number 100, a little milestone in the channel's history. If you've been following the channel for a while, then thanks for sticking with me. And if not, then there's a decent back catalogue now. I've investigated lots of the questions you might have about the transition, and they're all there for your viewing pleasure. If you've liked this week's video, then it will be a huge help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And I would love to have you as a subscriber of the channel if you want to see more from me. Thanks.